I'm Marianne Clements, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Sometimes I feel like I discover a hidden talent. Marianne Clements is probably somebody you've never heard of, but she's an amazing researcher, genealogist, anthropologist, historian, and writer. She calls herself a stay-at-home mom, though, which I think kind of undersells her amazing abilities. So, anyway, she's uh, working on a book about Nauvoo crime. It's going to be very interesting. We're going to talk about counterfeiting, murder. Were church leaders involved? Were they aware of some of these things? We'll, we'll answer those questions with Marianne Clements. We'll also talk about a couple of other myths that she's uncovered. Did a guy with a wooden leg walk from Alpine, Utah to the Salt Lake Temple every day on a wooden leg? That's a 30, 40 mile journey, I would say, and so it seems pretty unlikely. Anyway, we'll talk about that as well as she's going to correct the record on some polygamy as well. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have an amazing amateur anthropologist slash historian slash just all around amazing person. Can you go ahead and tell us who you are? My name is Marianne Clements and I... Like you said, I'm an amateur historian and hopefully going to be a professional genealogist soon. Yeah. So, and she does good work. I have to tell you, I had a big question about something and she sent me like this 20 page memo to fix everything. So, <laughs> so she does good work. So, um, so Marianne, this is funny because we've known each other for a long time. It feels yeah. like six Probably years six or something. Six years, yeah. Um, you're a blogger at Wheaton Terrace, I am. except for you don't blog very much anymore. I Yes, I've been delinquent the last <laughs> couple years. But we love Marianne at Wheaton Terrace because she's such an amazing... I remember when you started commenting, I was like, we need to get her to blog. She's amazing. She does amazing <laughs> research. You know, you'll get these stories about this and then Marianne will be like, well, I'm going to find out what really happened. <laughs> and she does. And so uh, a couple things that we want to talk about, we're going to talk about, um, I'm trying to decide, do you, do you have a preference where we go first? Um, we can probably cover the Wooden Lake story first and okay. then we can go into the crime. Okay, so it. let's talk about, so there's a, there a story about a guy who used to walk to the Salt Lake Temple with a wooden leg every day from Alpine or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so Marianne found out the true story. So and, and she posted this at Wheaton Tears. It won a Wheaties Award. <laughs> and then, uh, so anyway, go, tell us the story. Who is this guy with the wooden leg? And tell us the real story. The real not, story, not, yeah. not the myth, but the real story. Right. Well, I mean, I first got interested in it because I saw a blog post uh, where a guy was trying to critique the story just based on the distance between Alpine and Salt Lake and whether or not it was even feasible for a guy with a wooden leg and an amputee to be able to make the journey. And for me, it was, uh, the argument wasn't necessarily persuasive, but to, I had heard this story before both, you know, it's been talked about in general conference and also at uh, Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Camp. I remember hearing about this story about this guy. And so to me, I was like, we should be able to find contemporary evidence, like talking about this story, right? Because it's, so it's, Kind of cool. So it now, before my... you jump in there, because I love this already. We need to get your educational background. You have you have an oh. anthropology degree, right? I do. I have a bachelor's in anthropology. Yeah. So I attended Brigham Young University, and I got a bachelor's in anthropology with archaeology emphasis. Right. So so, so yeah, you've so got I a great it. research background, which is so obvious from your comments and your blog posts. We just wish you blogged more. I know. I know. And I need to. I need to. Um, but too busy yeah, doing was, genealogy. <laughs> I have, yeah, I have been busy with the genealogy stuff. So, um, but yeah, so at BYU, it was funny because we had to do these reports. Um, for after I graduated, while my husband finished up his degree, I worked at the Office of Public Archaeology um, for a year. And so, in order to do these reports, like, you know, you have to get the full context. And so, you're not just talking about the artifacts, you have to talk about the history of the location, you have to talk about the geology. You have to like bring in so many of these different elements that, um, yeah, so I learned there, like just, you know, all the different elements that you need to suddenly become a little bit of an expert on the like, you know, to bring in, to bring in the full context. Um, 
so yeah, I learned a lot of really good research skills there. Um, and that was actually where I first learned how to go into censuses. We had a headstone of a guy that got found on a, a dig. And everyone's like, why do we have this random headstone? Because the body wasn't there and it wasn't a cemetery <laughs> or anything. Oh, wow. So I had to look up this guy. It turned out, I, and so I went up to the BYU Family History Library and that was the first time I was like going through microfilm and stuff like that. And I ended up finding out that it was this old miner uh, who lived up at the Park City Hotel. And so that was really cool, just finding his story, found his obituary in the newspaper, you know, like all of these research, learning how to, you know, learning in the moment, on the job, like how to research these things. And so that really became really useful when I started getting more into family history and genealogy later. Um, but that was several years. I've been doing family history now for about 15 years um, as a hobby. And then a couple years ago, I um, decided to get a little bit more formal education in it. And so I started taking online classes through just slick through the Salt Lake Community College and got taught by some, you know, actual credentialed professional genealogists. And so I'm hoping to um, turn in my portfolio to become a credentialed certified genealogist wow. here next year. You know, the funny thing is in, mo in most wards that I'm in, I'm like the the cool guy like I know most about family history but then I meet people like you that just put me to shame and I have another professional she, she graduated in genealogy the bishop's wife and I gotta call out Kurt Franken by the way I've been trying to get on his thing because he does not talk about genealogy so Kurt I'm calling you out publicly you need to talk to me you need to talk to Marianne you need to talk to Janet Greenhouch <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so that's been really fun. I've had a family history consultant calling along with, you know, lots of other callings. For it's the part of the threefold years. or fourfold mission of the church, it Kurt. Is. So it come is. on, quit slacking. we got some good genealogists <laughs> here. <laughs> I've been able to volunteer at our local family history center for a couple hours a week for the last six years. All right. So it's been really cool. I'm hoping public pressure works because private pressure clearly doesn't work <laughs> on Kurt. So anyway. Back to our guy with the Back wooden to leg. Back the guy with the wooden leg, uh, John Rome Moyle. So he was a um, a British convert. He came over actually in the very first handcart company, and he was paid for by the Perpetual Emigration Fund. And as part of how he was paying back the Perpetual Emigration Fund, he would do work on the temple up in Salt Lake. So he would leave on Monday morning, um, and then he would stay the entire week in Salt Lake, and then he'd go back to his home down in Alpine. So he wasn't walking back and forth every he day. He wasn't walking back and forth every day. <laughs> and um, and that, yeah, so he would that say... That was the story, though, right? <laughs> he walked <laughs> well, on a okay. leg, No, he did, Alpine like, uh, when Elder Holland talked about it, he did mention he would go up on Mondays okay. and then come home on Fridays. Um, so, but he would probably stay with his son. Who and lived it probably up snowed and uphill in both directions. I know. And, yeah. <laughs> But no, anyway, so I was looking for contemporary records because I'm like, someone's got to be talking about this amputee who's going up to, you know, Salt Lake, like so often and working on the temple. And there's this, you know, there was even a movie made about him where it shows him like walking on his wooden leg, like up the steps and like carving the little holiness to the Lord on the temple because he did that. Um, but he probably carved it on the ground first. <laughs> it up there but anyway I ended up finding a record of when his leg got crushed and it was like it was in the newspaper um but his leg got crushed um not by being kicked by um a cow which was the, the family story um it, this newspaper talked about his leg getting crushed up in a canyon in a logging accident um and so but it literally talked about the leg just being crushed which is the story where he would actually he would get he gathered up all the bones from this part of his leg and he would kept them like he would hold them with him when he was buried with them <laughs> and i had remembered this story actually from dup stuff um daughters of utah pioneers. daughters of utah pioneers and so uh, so to me i was like oh this must have been when he crushed his leg but then when i looked at the date there was a problem this was eight months before he died which was significantly later than it should have been if he was working on the temple this whole time um, because he'd been working on the temple for years and years and years. Um, and so so he was like 80 years old when his leg got crushed. Um, so I was going through it and I realized, okay, if his leg's getting crushed eight months before his death, he's probably not actually going to Salt Lake and he's especially not walking up ladders with this wooden leg because he only had it for nine months, you know, 
maximum before his death. It is actually a really cool looking wood lake. Like, I don't know if you've seen, there's pictures on it on Family Search, um, but also on his find a grave, like where, I mean, he was a stonemason. He was really skilled. At, it's a really cool, like has the hinge. It has like this leather top. It's a really cool looking wood lake, but he probably only had it for about nine months. And so that was something that was really funny that just like going through and just being like, yeah, when he was working on the temple, he probably didn't have that wood lake. Um, that probably came afterwards. And so, yeah, like the walking up. So when he was walking, he had two really good legs. Also, the other issue, you know, once he would go over the hill, he probably did hike over the hill um, point, as opposed to going around point of the mountain. But then once he got over the hill, he would have been on a major road. So he probably was getting rides, hitching rides with people. And it's unlikely he was always walking the entire way. It just it probably wasn't. And luckily we had a commenter come in um, on the blog post and he was mentioning that when they went to his home and they were talking with people there, the, the tour guides people were mentioning that he probably did, um, you know, hitch rides and he probably was not walking the whole way. So, um, but there's this like tradition where um, these people will walk from Alpine to the Salt Lake Temple to kind of honor this pioneer with his wooden leg. And it's like, that's not actually how it happened. <laughs> but that's also like, he has a really cool story. I'm not trying to diminish his story at all. I'm just trying to correct it. And because it happens so often, I have pioneer ancestors where that totally happens too, where you look back and things didn't happen exactly the way that... Um, that we think they Family's did. Family lore says. Family lore, yep. So you have this folklore, and um, often the truth is actually just as cool as the folklore. So you don't actually need the folklore. <laughs> we don't have to make it harder. It's still cool he worked on the temple. It doesn't diminish the fact that, you know, he didn't have a wooden leg while he was working on the temple. That He still worked really hard. <laughs> you don't have to make it... <laughs> Complicated. We don't need to embellish it, you know, up, uphill and snow both ways on a wooden yeah. leg. <laughs> and so, and for me, like, one of the ways I approach it is I have a, you know, really strong belief that, you know, in an afterlife that these people are there. And I just think of, like, going up to them and just being like, you know, I tried to correct your story because who wants to be remembered for, like, the wrong details? Like, <laughs> people are like, I can't believe you were walking on that wooden leg the whole time. You'd be like, eh, that's not exactly how that happened. <laughs> So to me, I just think that we should really appreciate what they actually did because most people have pretty cool stories and they did some amazing stuff. Yes. So I just wanted to bring this up because this kind of shows you like the dogged nature of, of Marianne and how she just, she finds out really cool stuff and it's real, and she's a great writer, like wonderful writer. So, so anyway, so it seems like a few years ago, I believe you and I both went to the Sunstone presentation with, uh, I'm trying to remember her name, Karen Melanakis or something. I, don't know I did not attend that. her session. Oh, you didn't attend it? No, but I have read her work later. Okay, so I attended it. Yeah. And uh, so I think her name is Karen, right? Uh, I, Kathleen. Kathleen. So Kathleen had made this kind of a presentation that seemed to imply that... Uh, there was a counterfeiting operation in Nauvoo and that Mormon church leaders were in charge of it and, and were guilty of counterfeiting. And so that's where Marianne comes in to tell, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Okay. Well, okay, so <laughs> Kathleen has done so much research. She is a descendant of Heber C. Kimball. Um, and she basically took... so. Um, there's this historian, John L. Brooke, who wrote a book called The Refiner's Fire. And it talks about Mormon cosmology, and he talks about a lot of these accusations of counterfeiting. Um, and just like kind of relating it into, you know, a lot of people viewing the religion as counterfeit, and just like the relationship between that and all of these accusations of actually producing counterfeit um, money. And so Kathleen, um, in the introduction to her book, which I believe is called... I think it is just Mormon counterfeiting their secret combinations. I'll have to um, look that up. But she basically took that premise and then just explored all accusations of Mormon counterfeiting. Um, and so she starts, like, even before Joseph Smith, she goes into um, his 
you know, parents and just any accusations with them. And then she goes through and then she also does cover the Nauvoo period. But she really, um, and I don't necessarily agree with some of her uh, conclusions, but she by far has done the most extensive research on, you know, counterfeiting accusations against um, Mormons. And so her book is a really fabulous resource for, you know, just seeing all the different accusations. Um, so I got into it again with most things in family history from, uh, or most things in Mormon history from a family history angle. So I am a descendant of Theodore Turley and he was an early Mormon pioneer. And I, you know, I'm very involved with the Theodore Turley family organization. So I was researching him. And Rick Turley is part of that organization. Rick Turley is part of that. Yep. We are half third cousins. Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. So Theodore Turley has like thousands of descendants, thousands. So yeah, it's, it's a very big family. Um, but the organization, so I do a lot of work with the organization, um, and a lot of research. And so when I was researching Theodore Turley, I came across these accounts of him being, you know, one guy mentioned he was a really good counterfeiter. He was like one of the best out there. (laughs) Theodore like, Turley was wait, a good counterfeiter? Yeah, it's this guy named William Hall. Um, he wrote this expose about Mormonism, and he mentioned that Theodore was really skilled at it. And, you know, and so you're like, okay, well, that's kind of weird. And then I find out he was actually arrested for counterfeiting on counterfeiting accusations in Nauvoo in 1845. And, um, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? Like, was this... Because we'd had stories of Theodore making dyes for coins. And so we had these family stories that were kind of, you know, like tying into this. And so, and I knew a lot of them were more folklore, but I was like, but he definitely had the skills. So was he involved in the Kirtland Safety Society banking stuff? No, he was not because he joined the church in May of 1837, or sorry, March of 1837 up in Canada. So he didn't come down. He did make a visit to Kirtland, but he didn't really come down and join the Saints. Their family went straight from Canada down to Far West. So he really wasn't involved in the Kirtland period um, very much. But so he was from Birmingham, England, and he was trained, you know, Birmingham was like the manufacturing capital of the world. And so he was trained very specialized metalworking training. Um, and he was called a stamper, piercer, and a tool maker. So he literally would make the tools. Like when he would help out with people with the Nauvoo temple, his work was repairing the tools that the people were using or making the tools or procuring the, procuring the steel to make the tools so that other people could work on the temple. Like that was his job. So he had um, expertise in working with dyes, which if you think about like stamper and piercer, it's like a giant hole punch basically, or it's like an embossing tool. And so you could shape metal, you could cut metal. So he had skills with making dice. So it was definitely possible that he could have been helping with this. And so I wanted to learn a little bit more about the counterfeiting stuff. So from a family history angle, I wanted to know, you know, just like, how do I tell family members that he was accused of counterfeiting and arrested for it? And so that was my entry into the whole counterfeiting accusations. But the more I learned about the counterfeiting accusations and who had Theodore Turley arrested and who was making the accusations, it eventually became, you unraveled this huge story of this entire criminal subculture in Nauvoo that was just fascinating, that I had never seen really explored very well because you typically had um, a more uh, hostile you know, people who, you know, kind of with Kathleen Melanakis, who kind of take everything at face value. So all the accusations are true, obviously. And so, yes, so the, the church leaders in Nauvoo were heading up this massive criminal empire. And, you know, like, and so, of course, they were involved with, uh, you know, organizing theft rings and counterfeiting <laughs> rings and, you know, like all of this stuff. But then um, typically you would have the other side of the coin, you would have the people defending the church who would be like, no, these were all false accusations. And so they would just kind of dismiss everything. And so to me, I wanted to try to figure out, okay, what's, what's the truth here? Like, yeah, what's, what's true and what's false? What's true and what's false? Was this all just false accusations? Or... 
And so that was my foray into And so it. you presented this at Mormon History Association. I did, yeah. So, I mean, but, like, you only have 20 minutes to, like, do a presentation, right? So... So we can go longer here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm so glad about. So what I focused on for the presentation was um, the last few months. So of 1845 leading into the early exodus from Nauvoo and how the counterfeiting accusations related and actually ended up helping push the early exodus from Nauvoo. Um, so how, okay. Do you want me to kind of explain? Do I mean, how, we can go back further if you want. And because uh, I guess my question is, and, and, and those other questions, because it seems like Kathleen kind of implies that church leaders were aware of this counterfeiting and were involved in counterfeiting. And Would we're that, orchestrating it. Yeah. yeah. And you're talking, so Joseph Smith died in 1844. So does it go back before then? When he was still yes, alive? her argument is that it does go back before then. And her argument is, you know, uh, Joseph Smith was involved from the very, very beginning. And his parents, his father was involved in counterfeiting. So she really, um, like the first half of her book, really goes into that early New England stuff. And she goes into major counterfeiters who were up in um, New England that Joseph Smith may have been, you know, influenced by. And that, and that's the th one thing that you know I do really appreciate about her research is she does really bring in that counterfeiting is a very <laughs> old profession in the United States, well everywhere. Um, but you know there there is a really long history with counterfeiting in the United States, and um, so yes, that that was a thing that was going on. And what's really interesting is you have these exposés, these people who. You know, like they want to brag about how good of a counterfeiter they were. <laughs> so when they get caught, like sometimes they'll write these books, like you know, telling how brilliant they are, yeah. and just Unlike how cool. Unlike Mark it was. Hoffman, who's just a closed book, he won't yes. say anything. But um, so you have these really cool exposés, and so her argument is that you know Joseph Smith was very much influenced by this stuff. Now, my interest has been mainly more Nauvoo. And so that's more where I focus my research. Um, so one thing you have to kind of keep in mind is that Nauvoo, this border of Illinois, it's the, you know, the western edge of Illinois. You got the Mississippi River. You got Iowa. When the Mormons come in from Missouri, this is like frontier territory. And the frontier, you, it, they had so many problems with criminal gangs at this time. And that's something that I think... I don't think a lot of people quite realize. So while the, the Mormons are coming up, you have actually, in the early years of the Mormon period in Nauvoo, you actually have major criminal gangs who, um, vigilante groups, local groups, are actually cracking down on major criminal gangs up in northern Illinois, over in Ohio, and even down in Keokuk, um, Iowa. And so just as they're cracking down on the criminal gangs, eventually by like the mid Nauvoo period, you have a lot of these outside criminals who are now congregating in Nauvoo. So Nauvoo then becomes a big criminal haven. Now, is this because of the Nauvoo City Charter where one of the things Joseph did to protect himself was to say, hey, we don't recognize any other arrest warrants. It has to... Nauvoo has to approve it first. And so that was kind of helpful for these criminals. Yes, <laughs> to... it was. It was very helpful. And so that definitely was a big draw for a lot of people. There were criminals, there were Mormon criminals and non-Mormon criminals in Nauvoo early, but you don't really get the organized criminal gangs until a bit later. But yes, so if people don't know, like, so Missouri kept trying to extradite Joseph Smith. And so they kept firming up the laws in Nauvoo to protect Joseph Smith more, making it harder for outsiders to come in and arrest anyone inside Nauvoo. Not just Joseph. And, well, they made the rules to protect Joseph, but it ended up protecting criminals protecting too. Criminals too. <laughs> and so um, you get a lot of criminals who start coming into Nauvoo, especially around 1843 and later who you know just they find Nauvoo very attractive suddenly <laughs> you know <laughs> and they um the and a couple of them, doesn't reach into Nauvoo <laughs> it, yeah like it doesn't and um 
you know, a couple of them, several of them start being really good friends with Joseph Smith because they know if you can be really good friends with Joseph Smith, you can be protected from the law. And we have uh, several situations where Joseph Smith does step in to protect people and, pe- you know, surrounding communities get angry, very angry. So. Is there evidence that Joseph was aware that these guys were criminals? On one of them, yeah, there's a story of a guy named Jeremiah Smith, and he comes in, and he had defrauded the government out of $4,000. Um, he had claimed it, it. It was supposed to go to a different Jeremiah Smith, but he had claimed the money for himself. He had taken the money. So he was very clearly guilty. Um, and this, was, this happened, I believe, in the beginning of 1844. And Joseph Smith actually wrote out... Uh, a writ of habeas corpus before he was ever arrested, before Jeremiah Smith was ever arrested. And um, that was something, habeas corpus is when you're arrested, but then you want to claim that there was a problem with the arrest. And so he had actually given this guy basically a get out jail free card before he was ever even arrested. So like, and that just infuriated people. But yes, Joseph was aware that there were people who were criminals. Initially, there's a really good article from the John Whitmer Historical Society Journal by Bill Shepard. He's, ri- he's one of the few people that's really written some really good stuff on the crime in Nauvoo. Bill's a string out, by the way. Oh, yeah. So, um, but he goes in and he's written, and I, it's stealing at Mormon Nauvoo, I think, or theft at Mormon Nauvoo. And he goes in and talks about how in the early period, they were pretty open on like trying to get rid of all the Mormon thieves, trying to get, you know, like trying to crack down on them. They would publicly admit that they were having issues with these thieves in their communities. But then as you start moving towards the years, suddenly it becomes more of a liability to have these. And so they start kind of more covering up the fact that they're still having issues with these Mormon thieves. So that by the time you get to more Brigham Young, as a general rule to protect the community, they're, you know, they're kind of covering up some of this problems that they have. And they're starting to claim that it's false accusations. When you have Brigham Young later on the trail going, okay, guys, we seriously had problems with counterfeiting and theft and we need to stop. He's like, because that is a liability, massive liability. People are coming after us and I will not tolerate this anymore. Um, so it is interesting. Um, his article really does bring out um, the changing attitudes and the changing what they were saying publicly versus what they were trying to deal with privately in the problems with crime. Because you did have Mormon and non-Mormon criminals associated with Nauvoo committing crimes in the outlying areas. But as the church starts you know, becoming a bit more protective, it ends up making things worse because people begin to believe that the church is actually organizing it, not just protecting these people, but the church is now benefiting from, you know, these people will steal these, this livestock, people will steal money, and then they'll donate it to the church, they'll consecrate it to the church, right? And they call it like milking the Gentiles. Um, and people start to believe that church leaders really are behind this. And so there really is a concept that people are, you know, keep trying to defend the Mormons and the surrounding communities until like they start getting their stuff stolen. And then they're like, these Mormons really are criminals. And so, um, yeah, so they made a lot of enemies um, during that time. And, and the criminals took advantage of it. If they were caught, they would say, well, the Mormons made me do it. Or, you know, like, other people, like if Mormons caught them, they'd be like, oh no, it's false accusations that these Gentiles are making because you know they hate us. And so the criminals would just totally take advantage of the situation and it just made things worse. So. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the, the leaders were sort of aware of some of the counterfeiting activity and if it benefited them, they would kind of turn a blind eye. <laughs> Yeah, Joseph Smith apparently, Bill Shepard brings this out in his article, Joseph Smith apparently had this idea that he didn't really want to crack down hard on people who had a shady past. He wanted to give them time to, like, repent. He believed strongly in the principle of agency, maybe because he had some shady stuff, I don't know, in his past. Um, So he tended to be very tolerant of people, even if he knew that they had done some bad stuff in the past. And he wouldn't 
try to publicly embarrass them unless they came after him and then, you know, he would unleash it. But he, so yeah, so there was definitely some covering up. Um, the first indication you get, so people were passing counterfeit money, but the first indication you get that people are actually starting to manufacture counterfeit coins in Hancock County is um, in August of 1842. We get this non-Mormon who gets caught um, with these dice for making, so with the, you had counterfeiting going on with paper money, you had counterfeiting going on with coins, metal coins, and they were a little bit different processes. So usually with the paper money, people would purchase it from the good printers who could print the high quality. So they would usually purchase the money. They didn't usually manufacture it there. But there was enough blacksmiths, enough people that knew how to deal with um, metal that as long as you got some good quality dyes, you could actually manufacture your own metal coins. And so that's what this guy, William Millard, had done is he had procured, procured these dyes and he was wanting to manufacture. So he got caught because he was talking to people down in Warsaw, trying to get them to go in on this whole manufacturing counterfeit coin. And so when he gets caught, he talks about people in Ramos, Macedonia, which is a Mormon community on the east side of Hancock County. And they had major problems with crime. And he was talking about how so the newspaper reports talk about how there was this significant crime. And so Mormon leaders must have been aware that it's going on. At this point in 1842, they're not accusing the Mormon leaders of orchestrating it. But they are saying that, you know, there's enough, based on what this William Millard is saying, this non-Mormon William Millard, it does appear that there is major crime happening and that church leaders must be aware of it. Like, and that's how the newspaper um, reports it. And then later on, we get, and I can like seriously talk about this forever. (laughs) At the end of 1842, we get this guy, Joseph H. Jackson, who comes in. And we know his story because he wrote this huge expose. And he he came in in the fall of 1842, um, and someone tries to kill him in Nauvoo. Someone knows about his past. He was a shady guy. And someone tries to kill him. He gets mad. He thinks Joseph Smith tried to have him killed, even though we have no idea why. So he ends up spending the winter in one of the other towns. I can't remember if it's Carthage or Warsaw, but he spends the winter there. And he goes up to the sheriff in the area. And he's like, you know what? I can go in and I can go underground in Nauvoo and I can find out what's really happening. And he's like, and and so I can be like basically the spy for you in Nauvoo. And so, and the sheriff is like, okay, sure. So then Joseph... So he kind of turns state's evidence and he's trying to bust he, people. But it's, it's a preemptive thing. And criminals, he's one of the first people to do it with the Mormons, but other people start kind of hedging their bets because if they talk about it to like the sheriff and say, oh no, I'm going to work for you. I'm going to participate in this criminal activity. But really, it's in order to catch the people. And so they're totally playing both sides. It it happens in the future, too, in Nauvoo. But this is one of the first instances where Joseph H. Jackson totally admits he did this. So he's hedging his bets. If he gets caught doing criminal activity, he can totally get out of it because he can say, oh, yeah, well, I was participating in order to, you know, learn how bad these people were. He's like, "So so he's getting himself a get out of jail free card. So he goes to Nauvoo. He tells Joseph Smith that he was a former Catholic priest who was running from the law from Georgia and because he killed a guy. And so Joseph Smith, like, supposedly takes pity on him. Why would he kill a guy? I. Why would a priest kill a guy? (laughs) This is what he claims he told him. Um, I can't remember what Joseph Smith reports, but. He ends up getting really close to Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith, for some reason, does actually seem to trust him initially. And we get this from William Clayton's diary, where Joseph Smith initially like seems to like him. But Joseph H. Jackson talks about how Joseph Smith totally trusted him, and how he got into his confidence, and Joseph Smith ordered him to go kill Governor Boggs because Rockwell had failed at it. And so, you know, so he's... 
And so, but Joseph H. Jackson, you can't really totally trust what he says because he's, he's really like most people when I look into their lives I find them interesting and you know I learn to kind of like them and he's one of those guys I really don't like like the more you learn about him the more creepy he just becomes eventually Joseph Smith clues in fairly quick that Joseph H. Jackson is not a good guy and so with like over the course of a week like you hear in William Clayton's journal, Joseph Smith starts saying he's this black-hearted guy, he's this horrible person. <laughs> but somehow he still is able to kind of stick around Nauvoo, and he has this power in Nauvoo. So according to Joseph H. Jackson, he's the, um, it's Joseph Smith who brings up the idea of, he wants Joseph H. Jackson to start up this huge counterfeiting operation in Nauvoo. So Joseph Smith made Joseph H. Jackson start this massive counterfeiting operation in Nauvoo. That's Jackson's story. That's Jackson's version, yeah, from his expose, which he printed. It, it was printed in 1844, it, like just a few months after Joseph Smith got killed. So Joseph H. Jackson claimed... Which is kind of convenient. <laughs> it is. Well, but he had turned, he had, um, before Joseph Smith had died, he had actually, you know, there's more to his story. I'll go into that. <laughs> so he ends up... Yeah. Um, and other people do that too with Joseph Smith. But so he ends up in his expose, he talks about these two guys who are friends of Joseph Smith from Buffalo, New York. That's, that's how he explains it. These guys, Barton and Eaton from New York, they come down, they start staying in the homestead and they're supposedly these mechanics who are making this big thing. So Everyone knows that they're working on this technology inside. And so he says that they, they came down and they started this big, huge um, counterfeiting operation, really professional, good quality counterfeiting operation. And of course, these are Joseph Smith's friends from Buffalo um, because Joseph Smith's the one that's making Joseph H. Jackson do this big, huge counterfeiting operation. Um, eventually, uh, it, Joseph H. Jackson gets on the outs with um, both Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith. Joseph H. Jackson tries to court Hiram Smith's daughter. So he has a particular, he tries, <laughs> he does not like Hiram Smith. And it comes out a lot in his expose. But he claims that, you know, Hiram Smith and most of the 12 were all involved in this counterfeiting operation. And he, you know, talks about he was privy to the whole polygamy thing. And, you know, so he would, you know, kind of talk about that. And eventually it comes out that Joseph H. Jackson is, the church leaders come out against Joseph H. Jackson. Um, partly because he starts working with the dissenters. And based on affidavits, he's actually telling the laws that Joseph Smith's going to have them killed. And so he's working with the laws to try to get Joseph Smith killed. And so he starts fomenting this thing, and he, and he tells Joseph Smith that the laws are going to kill him. And so, like, he's, like, seriously working this whole... The laws are killing Joseph, and Joseph is killing the laws. So the he's laws. Just really, so he's, yeah, like... William Law and... Wilson Law, Wilson his Law. brother. Two people who are involved in the criminal community, they're not Mormon... Marinus G. Eaton, this Eaton and Barton guy that had helped, that had come in from New York to help with the counterfeiting, he ends up hearing this and he gets really concerned. And so he talks to another guy who was involved with counterfeiting, Dr. Um, Abiathar Buck Williams. And so they end up coming out with these affidavits that are published in the newspaper talking about how Joseph H. Jackson was telling the laws that... Um, you know, that Joseph Smith was going to have them killed, and he wanted to try to get Joseph Smith assassinated. And so that ends up causing this big, huge problem. And so Joseph H. Jackson from then on, and this was just a couple months before Joseph Smith is killed, but Joseph H. Jackson was really a major part of just fomenting just chaos. He just thrived on chaos and, like, and just... Because he, he was always able to kind of take advantage of it, to his own advantage. And then he ends up going back to the sheriff 
The sheriff is able to, you know, like validate his story. He's like, yeah, before he went to Nauvoo, he told me he was going to go try to like, f- you know, find all these crimes that they're doing and to try to expose them. And so before Joseph Smith dies, Joseph H. Jackson does write a letter talking about all of the crimes um, in the newspaper. And then later on, um, a couple months later, that's when he writes his big expose. Because he's now famous. He can tell exactly, you know, all the crimes that Joseph Smith had and how he had gone undercover to try to, like, you know, discover all of them. So, yeah, so he was, he was a bad guy. He was not a good guy. <laughs> he was really not a good guy. Playing all sides against each other. He just, he was. He was just fomenting chaos. He really was. Um, turns out, when I was doing research on this Eaton and Barton, I discovered that Barton was an alias for a guy. His name was actually Augustus Tiffany. And I figured it out because uh, Marinus G. Eaton named one of his kids after Augustus Tiffany. And I'm like, that's weird that you have an Augustus Tiffany and we have an Augustus Barton who comes to Nauvoo. And he's really good friends with Marinus Gilbert Eaton. So, like, could this actually be the same guy? It totally was. It was the same guy. And they were definitely involved in counterfeiting. Eaton had been caught uh, passing counterfeit paper money. Augustus, in in New York where he lived, Augustus uh, Tiffany was from Buffalo, which Joseph H. Jackson knew that. None of the other people in Nauvoo knew that these guys were from Buffalo, but Joseph H. Jackson knew that, which I think is really interesting. It turns out that I'm finding this court case where Augustus Tiffany is testifying against this counterfeiter talking about how this counterfeiter had kept this chest of counterfeit coins in his hotel. And turns out Augustus Tiffany was actually working with several different big counterfeiters, but he was testifying in this particular case. But at the same time that there's this case in Buffalo where Augustus Tiffany is testifying related to counterfeiting, There's also a case where this guy named Joseph Jackson has gotten arrested and is going through a trial for counterfeiting. And so I'm like, okay, so we have a case of a Joseph Jackson in Buffalo, New York, on trial for counterfeiting at the same time that we know Augustus Tiffany is there because he's also testifying on a counterfeiting case. Like, so were these really Joseph Smith's friends from Buffalo, New York, (laughs) or are these actually Joseph H. Jackson's friends from Buffalo, New York? And so I probably lean towards the latter. I suspect Joseph H. Jackson um, had brought his friends down. There were more professional counterfeiters. So that's, so they, that was one counterfeiting operation happening in Nauvoo that we can be pretty sure on. There's, later on, New York actually sends an extradition request to Nauvoo, to the governor of Illinois, to try to get uh, Marinus G. Eaton back in New York because back on his old when he was caught uh, passing counterfeit bank bills. And so they actually send an extradition request. Marinus G. Eaton is actually arrested in Nauvoo based on this extradition request, but people help him escape. And of course, and this is at the end of 1844, beginning of 1845. And so, of course, the Warsaw Signal publishes this newspaper article about, of course, the Mormons are helping this king of bogus making, (laughs) Marinus G. Eaton, escape when these New York people are coming to arrest him. And so it just, it looked bad on the Mormons all around. So even though he was not a member, but he was absolutely involved in a major counterfeiting operation in Nauvoo. The question is, were church leaders involved with it? Were they, I suspect they were probably aware that stuff was going on. Were they involved with it? That's, that's an issue we're still figuring out. Another counterfeiting operation. We had probably, from what I can estimate, we had probably three different counterfeiting operations going on in Nauvoo around about the same time. All in the, the latter period of the Nauvoo stuff. So I can go into some of those as well. Okay. So another one was headed up by a guy named Edward Bonney. And like Bonnie and Clyde? (laughs) Okay, well Bonnie and Clyde, Bonnie was a girl. (laughs) 
Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Edward Bonnie. So, because they're spelled different. This is B-O-N-N-E-Y. Yes. And Bonnie and Clyde is I-E? Yes. Okay. Okay, so Edward Bonnie. So he was another guy from New York. He had moved down to Indiana. And while he was in Indiana, he... Uh, and he, he's mentioned in the article, like the presentation yeah, I did at Mormon I remember Association. that name. He's another well-known guy because he, he's another guy that wrote an expose, really cool expose, um, Banditi of the Prairies, which again, with any expose, you have to take it with a grain of salt because usually they have a motive for writing it. Um, his motive <coughs> for writing his was to um, kind of prove his innocence. He'd been accused of some stuff, which he did but he wanted to clear his name um in the public eye so he goes to elkhart in um county indiana um while he's there he starts participating in counterfeiting he's um suspected by the people around him there's reports um, but he actually ends up getting caught in the act of manufacturing tons of Mexican coins, which people were using for money, and American half dollars in Ohio. Um, and he's working with a couple friends, but he gets caught like thousands and thousands of dollars worth of coins. And he is like actively making them. In that day, it was actually kind of hard to prosecute people for counterfeiting because there was so much counterfeit money going around. You couldn't necessarily just accuse someone if they had counterfeit money in their possession because they could always claim, oh, I didn't know it was counterfeit. Right. But when you had a situation where he's actively making the counterfeit coin and they catch him in the act, then it's very clear that he's going to go to jail. And usually jail sentences you know, would be for a couple years, usually five years, two to five years that they would end up being in jail. So it was one of those, if you got convicted of counterfeiting, you were going to be in jail for a while. But it was very hard to get someone convicted. But because the evidence was so strong against him, he ends up um, being in jail for about a month, and then he gets out on bail. There's a guy there in Ohio who agrees to put up the $1,000 bail a thousand dollars in eighteen forty two. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. He agrees to sign up for the thousand dollar bail to guarantee that Edward Bonney will come back for the next term of court. Cause they usually had court terms happening in that county. And this was all over, usually only twice or three times a year. They had these circuit courts that would go around. And so this lawyer, this local lawyer, agreed to put up the thousand dollars if Bonnie doesn't show at the next court term. And Bonnie was not going to show at the next court term. So what Bonnie does is on the very same day that he's released from jail, you get this deed where he actually deeds like his most valuable land in Indiana over to this guy who supposedly paid $10,000 for it when he didn't. The lawyer. The lawyer. So he basically deeds the lawyer the land in order to cover the cost because the lawyer is going to be on the hook for $1,000. <laughs> so Edward Bonney goes back to Indiana. And usually at this time, you can kind of wait it out because if people don't show up to court, then the case is continued to the next term. And sometimes, you know, six months later, a lawyer just doesn't want to deal with it. And so they'll just dismiss the case. And so that's kind of what he was betting on. They would eventually just dismiss the case. They don't dismiss the case. And so um, in 1844, Ohio sends out an extradition request to Indiana so that they can, because you can't just go into another state and arrest someone. The governors have to send it in an official request. So they send, and at the same time, early 1844, Bonnie decides he wants to move to the Mississippi River to get out of Indiana so he's not arrested. <laughs> so he goes to Nauvoo and that's when he goes and he just had heard so many great things about Nauvoo and that's why he wanted to go there and of course like we know that at this point you know Nauvoo has now developed a strong reputation that people cannot be extradited from Nauvoo because Joseph Smith um, Missouri had tried several times so if he's ever going to go someplace that's a really good spot to go if he's trying to avoid extradition um, and so he ends up coming into Nauvoo just a f 
few months before Joseph Smith is killed. But somehow he gains because he wants to become really good friends with Joseph Smith. Right. So he's able to gain the trust of Joseph Smith very quickly. He's admitted almost immediately to the Council of 50. He's really? admitted to the Council of 50 before he even moves there. So he comes out for a visit to, and his brother had lived in Nauvoo for a few years. His brother was a Mormon. He'd converted to Mormonism in the early 1830s. So um, he was aware of Nauvoo. It, he talks about in his expose, like, I didn't know anything about the Mormons <laughs> before I went there, but no, he did. He did. <laughs> he, and he had actually owned some land out in Iowa. So he had, he had visited the area many years before in 1839. We have him documented out in Iowa. And he was counterfeiting at that time, too. So he knew the area. He knew where he'd be safe. And so he went to Nauvoo. So yeah, so he was one of the few people admitted. There was three non-Mormons who were admitted to the Council of 50. Edward Bonney, who was absolutely a counterfeiter. Marinus G. Eaton, one of the absolute for sure counterfeiters. And then this other guy, Uriah Brown, who was this uh, inventor. As far as I know, he wasn't involved in any crimes. But it is interesting that you had to, two of the three non-Mormons were definitely counterfeiters who got um who were invited while joseph smith was still alive to join the council of 50 in um, april of 1844 bonnie goes back to indiana grabs his wife grabs his kids and they come out and they live in nauvoo and he comes in in may and everything is kind of hitting the fan at that point um just as far as things getting really just tense but he still sets up a counterfeiting operation. He's, he has two presses that he brings in. That counterfeiting presses where he manufactures uh, coins in Nauvoo. Um, and it's interesting. When you look at a lot of the documents just ahead of uh, Joseph Smith's death, he, Bonnie apparently presented himself as a lawyer. He was not a lawyer. <laughs> but clearly he had been studying up on the law quite a bit, probably in order to figure out how he could get around being extradited to Ohio. <laughs> so he did. So he's, it's really odd. So at the, um, in June at the Nauvoo Expositor trial, he's actually one of the lawyers representing one of the sides. And he's, He's not a lawyer, but Joseph Smith keeps thinking he's a lawyer. And so when Joseph Smith goes to jail, he's, you know, like for, it ends up being for treason, which is why he's kept in the jail. But he initially was taken um, because of the destruction of the press. Riot, I think it was. It was riot, yeah. And then eventually the charges get switched to treason because he had declared martial law in Nauvoo. But in order to kind of argue that there was a reason that he needed to or order martial law because the press, because they really were going to try to kill him, the press really was a nuisance. Um, and in order to do that, he, like when he's in uh, Carthage jail, some of the people he actually requests to come down are Marinus G. Eaton, Dr. Beathar Williams, and Edward Bonney. And Williams and Eaton are because of that affidavit from because of the affidavits they had sworn um, from Joseph H. Jackson, that they could prove that there was an effort to try to foment discord in order to get Joseph Smith killed. And Edward Bonney, probably because he thought he was a lawyer who could help him get out of this. And Edward Bonney, again, I want to stress, he was not a lawyer. He never presents himself as a lawyer after Nauvoo. But yeah, but Joseph Smith, every time he writes, Edward Bonney, Esquire, yes. It's so weird. I talked with another researcher who'd really looked into Edward Bonney, and he was like, no, he was a lawyer. I'm like, no, he was, he was not. He had owned, he had, he really, he had um, tried to do land speculation. He had purchased tons of land um, in Elkhart County, Indiana. He had built his own Mills, Bonneville. He was like wanting to create his own town. He he wanted, and it just, it never ended up taking off. And so he did end up accruing a lot of debts, which is probably why he started counterfeiting in the first place. 
to pay back the debts. But, um, but he ends up um, operating a store in Nauvoo, and then he moves over to Montrose, Iowa, um, after Joseph Smith's death. So that's another counterfeiting operation that we know was happening in Nauvoo around the time of Joseph Smith. We have records of Mormons who were getting arrested for counterfeiting, passing counterfeit money before Joseph Smith died and afterwards. So, I mean, the idea that people were accusing Mormons of counterfeiting, they had legitimate reasons to believe that Mormons were counterfeiting. They had these affidavits from Joseph H. Jackson saying that the leaders were absolutely in on it. So the idea that people thought the Mormons were heading this huge counterfeiting operation makes a lot of sense um, because definitely Nauvoo was producing a lot of counterfeit money that then was getting passed to all the communities around. One example of a guy, uh, he is spacing on his name, but in early, in like June of 1844, he's down in St. Louis and he gets caught with counterfeiting instruments on him, but he also has his elder certificate signed by Joseph Smith saying that he's a missionary and an elder for the church. And so, of course, that just gets plastered all over the newspapers, that there's this Mormon elder in St. Louis, and he goes to jail for five years. He serves five years in the Missouri Penitentiary. For counterfeiting. For counterfeiting. Um, so, yeah, and there's other members, Latter-day Saints, that serve jail time for counterfeiting from Nauvoo. Anyway, but we also have a Mormon named Peter Haas. He admits that he was involved in counterfeiting in Nauvoo. So apparently there is a group of members of the church who were also doing some sort of low-level counterfeiting. And it's interesting because later on, we get this uh, report that there were three levels of counterfeit money, and the most, the best counterfeit money was the most expensive to buy. And then you had a middle level and you had a lower level. And I suspect that it probably was these um, three different counterfeiting operations going on that were producing various quality of counterfeit money. Um, because again, you didn't want to get caught passing counterfeit money knowing that it was counterfeit money because that was jail time. People took it seriously. Then we get to, so yes, absolutely, there were counterfeiting operations going on in Nauvoo. Um, they actually called the money Nauvoo bogus. Bogus was a term that they would use for um, counterfeit coin. And the quality of some of the counterfeit money coming out of Nauvoo was so good that they would actually, <laughs> they, you know, they would talk about how it was really a good quality of um, coin, but it was counterfeit. So Nauvoo absolutely had a reputation for producing counterfeit coin. But even fairly late in the game, you had place, if you got farther out from Nauvoo, you had people who had a little bit more realistic view and saying, it's probably not the Mormons. There's probably other people or more organized gangs that are in there because like a Chicago paper paper mentioned it. They're like, because, you know, we've had issues with definitely organized gangs and stuff. So we don't necessarily think it's the Mormons, but th there's definitely criminal stuff going on in Nauvoo that's based in Nauvoo. But again, because of that Nauvoo charter, you actually have criminals who are coming in, who are purchasing land in Nauvoo, who are joining the church, like in some cases. And it does seem to be after this 1843, after Joseph Smith has definitely proven that he can get out of extradition, that um, they're tightening up the charter to make it harder for people to arrest um, people inside Nauvoo. And what's fascinating is Edward Bonney, who was a criminal, in his expose, he is very upfront with the fact that criminals came to Nauvoo to avoid getting caught, to avoid getting arrested. And what's funny is, of course, he doesn't claim he's one of those, but he really was one of those criminals that came to Nauvoo to avoid being arrested. So that is something people do need to realize. Nauvoo was a haven. Nauvoo was seen as a criminal haven for good reason. So uh, there were a lot of problems of both Mormons and non-Mormons uh, criminal activities going on in and around Nauvoo. 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Marianne Clements. In our next conversation, we're going to turn from counterfeiting to murder. So, but they, one of them ends up leaving his cap there. Um, William Hodges leaves his cap there. And they run back and they go back to Nauvoo. Um, so suddenly, so the people are in the area are infuriated. They're like, this is, because robbery is one thing. Murder, like, that's a whole different story. And that was one thing that a lot of the thieves at the time knew. Like, you can, you can threaten people, you can do all you want, but you do not kill people. Because people, you know, the, the citizens wouldn't stand for it. So there's this massive manhunt. There's this $500 reward which gets put up by the people to find these murderers. And that's, that's a lot of money back then. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks. <laughs>